morning, everybody. It's Steve Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, we're going to continue our discussion about managing the core emotions we talk about during uh, the basics of uh, tension management training. Uh, we've talked pretty extensively about anger and grief, and Brian is not on the call yet, but he sent me an email. Let me open it up for just a second about an article he found specifically on the subject of what stress does to the brain. Hmm. And so we'll wait for him to uh, to join the call, and then I'll let him talk about that. But I did have an, apps, uh, an opportunity to look at that, but it was all about what happens to our attentional faculties uh, when under stress from fear, et cetera. In fact, you know what? Let me go ahead and do this. Could you share that with all of us? Yeah, I'm about, to, I'm about to chat it over to everybody. Wow, that sounds um, interesting. I will tell you that it comes from the National Library of Medicine. Um, mm. So you should be able to see that. And I don't know if it'll let us read more than the abstract. Oh no, it's the entire piece of uh, research by the looks of things. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so there you go. So uh, when um, when Brian joins in, we'll let him share with us why he felt compelled to <laughs> send this over. But there you go. So I just chatted that over to everybody. Um, Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and set the stage just one second. Edie, I can hear a bunch of background uh, noises. I'm going to mute you for a bit. You can. Well, actually, it's not. It's not Edie. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah, 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 Dragon, that was you. So just feel free to unmute yourself anytime you'd like to um, share whatever you'd like to share and what's going on. Okay, so anyway, managing emotions. We talked about anger. We talked about grief. And one of the things that we're really getting to as we work our way through this is while each of these emotions does have kind of like a spot on the change grid that from a basic perspective, we consider where it lives that because these emotions at their worst are in danger zones, the danger zones are all physically adjacent. And so we may very well find a variation on each one of those emotions uh, in different places. So specifically, we talked about anger. And we said the way anger is handled by someone who's in the upgrade danger zone um, is the most, the most obvious, the most blatant. That's the one we consider to be like the, the hallmark location. But people outgrade become angry, but they become angry in a different way. And they do anger they handle their anger in different ways. And if we look down grid, there's anger down in deep, deep apathy as well. But it, again, it's experienced and expressed in a different way. Um, also, as we work our way around to the a very far in grid danger zone, same thing. So there, there are variations, but they're all there. Uh, similarly for grief. We talked about grief as being, um, it's kind of like home location is certainly up grid because it is a feeling of being very much out of control. But we can find grief uh, experienced in all four of these extremes, but it is experienced and expressed in different ways. So let's see if that pattern continues as we talk about the third of the emotions that we are likely to encounter very far up grid, um, and that is fear. So fear is an interesting little uh, um, emotion to take a look at. And uh, I really wish Bram was on this call because maybe one of the others on, on the team who, who have a background in, uh, in brain, um, uh, brain theory and all that. But fear is considered to be perhaps one of only two true instincts that humans have. And uh, it's been characterized as the instinct that keeps us alive. Um, and what I mean by that is that something at a very primal level um, causes us to be highly alerted when our senses detect anything that can threaten us. So if we hear again the sound of a, of a twig snapping behind us somewhere, uh, or we feel the earth rumbling or whatever the case may be, or we smell something that um, is, is not quite right, there is something that's happening with us at a very deep, deep instinctual level that tells us a threat to our safety uh, could be imminent. And uh, what emotion accompanies that threat, a feeling of threat, but this, uh, this feeling of fear. 
And so this fear is what heightens our, our senses so that we look more closely at whatever it is that we detected to find out if a true threat exists or if it's still something going on, but nevertheless not something that poses an imminent danger to our reality. So, um, so Edie, Dragon, uh, Kathy, anybody have any comments you want to make about the idea that, uh, that fear might be an instinct? that uh, keep, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say that, you know, I know that spiritually, you know, what I understand and what I know is that the two, the only two real emotions or states of humans are fear and love, and that fear encompasses all the other stuff. Yes. So that, you know, fear is a, like the root of anger, grief, shame, all those other negative emotions and they all have their their stem in fear so that makes sense yes very interesting yes yeah. something has happened that threatens us or we perceive as a threat and we experience whatever the fear is instinctually but it may quickly manifest itself as anger or grief or any number of other variations that's interesting dragon you've unmuted what yeah you... yeah I, th I think it's a uh, deep down a sort of uh, defense system uh it's mm -hmm. also on an unconscious level otherwise you couldn't uh, react quickly enough to save yourself sometimes right exactly and, ind and indeed as you say uh it's again about the perceived uh, threat doesn't threat matter if it's real as long as it's perceived then for you it's real yeah. right and then that fear then is obviously uh, may very well trigger a survival instinct survival um, mm. behavior maybe it's going to be flight maybe it's going to be uh, fight could be fade could be freeze Yep. So those are those are the four possibilities. Um, okay. Now uh, the other instinct, by the way, uh, is uh, the uh, we don't like um, falling. So there is an instinct all about that. And I think the one that's that I remember about how that's kind of tested, proven out is um, uh, with grip strength in newborn um, uh, humans, newborn babies. So apparently. Someone uh, did a little bit of research where they took a bit of rope or whatever, and they hung it above the baby's crib, and then they lifted the baby up ever so slightly so that its hands could actually uh, reach that that cord. And within a very few days, I forget how old the babies were when they started to, to show this, but they would grab hold of whatever that, that string is, and they would not let go. And so uh, it may not be uh, basically, I think it is that we don't need to learn through direct experience that falling is a bad thing. Apparently, if, we if have I some just, sort of... Yeah, go ahead. If I may just add, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, I even have a karate mate who did that with his kid, you know, to test. And he said, yeah, he did it, you know. He, yeah, he you can... He held himself. You yeah. can hold yourself and you can hold yourself for a long but time. It's, it's, uh, it's also the same with... Uh, putting babies in water, you know, to swim, they automatically, of course, stop uh, breathing. Right. So isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, you know, humans yeah. aren't really all that, uh, we're not really run by emotion, by, sorry, by instinct the way so many other creatures may be, at least we don't think we are. Um, but there's, there's a few that I think fall in that category. And fear was one of the ones that came up the, as the instinct that keeps us alive. Okay. So, Obviously, where's the hallmark location for fear? If we want to look at the change grid, where do you think you're absolutely positively going to find fear? And the answer is, well, come on, very far up grid. I'm in a situation where the challenge is extremely high and I view myself as having no ability to handle it. <laughs> so I'm terrified. I'm way beyond you know, simple, gentle fear. Uh, I'm in an impossible situation. My life is very much threatened. And so certainly we're likely to encounter fear up there um, and uh, you know, respond accordingly. Is it possible that someone who's very far out grid may also be experiencing fear, but how do they experience it, express it, and perhaps uh, deal with it or use it differently than others might? They control it. So they control the fear, okay? Tell us a little bit more about that. 
Well, it's just like uh, we talked about the emotions, you know, I mean, uh, are the emotions getting a hold of you or are you getting a hold of emotions? Mm -hmm. You can also uh, do this with uh, the feeling mm. of fear. Yeah. I, now, I think they also control others and they act out. I mean, that's where violence can occur. I mean, O.J. Simpson, don't, don't you think people that are out grid control their fear by controlling other people, even if they have to destroy them? Well, I'm glad both of you brought up what you brought up, because I think we're looking at a bit of a continuum of, of how that fear may happen. Because those people that like control the fear, who wrote the book, feel the fear, but do it anyway or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's all been talked about that people who accomplish great things um, are willing to acknowledge that they are willingly stepping into risky situations, but they feel as though they are prepared. So keep in mind that someone who is pre at a perceived challenge of 10, but view, view themselves as having an ability of 10 to handle that challenge, they're not minimizing the, the, uh, the challenge. They are acknowledging, oh, no, this challenge definitely exists. But but I also believe I have what it takes to meet that challenge. And so that actually all sounds very, very healthy right out to here, maybe even a little bit into the danger zone for, uh, for real uh, dramatic kinds of a situation. I'll give you some examples in just a second. But out here in the danger zone, that fear may very well continue to grow and may now cause a giant question mark in the person's mind about their actual ability to handle that. As I'm describing that, they're actually moving up grid. So that's, uh, that's not the example I'm looking for. If I go to 11-11 or 12-12, I think it's that the person continues to perceive themselves as having great ability, but they are deluded. And they have this superhero kind of um, kind of mindset. Um, and that's where I think they can start doing what Edie has been describing. So they're fearless about consequences that might come their way. And they're going to push through no matter the cost. Mm -hmm. So are they still confronting the fear? Yes. But... Um, they express their fear by fighting aggressively uh, against it by whatever threatens them. Yeah. Okay. That's all fitting together as far as like the survival instinct that's out here is to fight. Well, what are they fighting? Who are they fighting? Um, and that's that fear that ends up driving it. So, so uh, is that okay to kind of recognize? Okay, yeah, Kathy, go right ahead. You just muted. No, no, I was going to say I really like what, what Edie said, and and I think that what as you were as you were expressing it, it makes a lot of sense because somebody who who does go into that danger zone but sees themselves in power is going to push that fear and and aggress with the fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what they're doing in the in the uh, outgrid is aggressing. Yes. With fear and uh, and creating fear in others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an antidote for their own fear. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense, particularly if we want to look at things like sports and uh, military um, activities in the outgrid quadrant. Uh, so, like, for example, for sports, someone sent us a video of some, um, what do they call it, X Games, the real uh, modern kind of thrill games. And one of them is people riding these BMX bicycles all along the crests of hills and things like that and down severe slopes and on and on. And anyone who's looking, it just kind of goes like, if you lose control of that bike, you're dead. And you just go like, okay, where are they on the change grid? Well, obviously, they don't, they don't minimize the challenge of what it is they're facing. They recognize they're doing a thrill seeker kind of an activity, and it wouldn't be thrilling if it wasn't dangerous. Um, but they view themselves as having the ability to tackle all that. That's definitely this driven driver, outgrid kind of thing. And when they get stupid, they might end up in the outgrid danger zone, where they're actually uh, overestimating their ability as they tackle a challenge challenge that is beyond their capabilities. And that's why sometimes thrill seekers hurt themselves, if not, you know, kill themselves. Yeah, I, I think you're mentioning something interesting here around um, when you make the analogy to sports and military, 
I find that those uh, high performing individuals that are there are actually in the 10 10 zone and really in the optimal place as opposed to the 11 and 12 positions mm -hmm. where they're uh, they're not assessed. They're, they're thrill seeking for a different reason. They're not assessing the reality of the situation. Well, that's uh, a really good point, because I think it was a few sessions ago. I think it might have been Kathy who brought up um, that the world's top snipers are actually in the exact center of the change grade when they're doing their work. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, I've seen these YouTube videos where you get guys that climb up on these uh, antenna radar things and, you know, they're, who knows, a mile up and, you know, the likelihood of them falling, in my view, is like, I'd be terrified, you know, being yeah. on two stories, much less up there. Right. But, right. but these guys, they love it. This is their whole thrill. And you hear the stories of all of them dying from doing this type of activity and you have to wonder, like, what is the mentality of somebody like that? Yeah. Uh, because what's, what is there to gain from doing it? Exactly. It bragging rights, or these days, it would be uh, views on their YouTube videos. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, social media. So I think that what you're looking at there is someone who is at 1010 on a, on a good day. Mm-hmm. But the ones that end up dying, I believe we're having an 1111 or a 1212 day. Mm -hmm. And that was their mistake. They overestimated their ability and or underestimated the challenge and found themselves poorly equipped to tackle some risk mm -hmm. that they freely stepped in front of. Remember one of the hallmarks of the outgrade danger zone is that these individuals create risk where it, pure, where it doesn't naturally exist purely to make things more interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, because the people that are really doing it well, that's 1010. Now, I think we also talked about the tightrope walkers. They're at 1010. They have to achieve a Zen state to be able to do what they're doing. Where these guys on the BMX bicycles, I think that the situation is demanding far more immediate physical response uh, capabilities uh, be readily available to them. And that would be something mm -hmm. further out grid. Yeah, you guys think am I I'm on the right track or am I missing something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'd just like to add that um, I agree that a lot of them would like to have likes on YouTube for sure. But yeah. I know that I know that a lot of them also need the kick, the adrenaline. Or to, well, they, they do. They, they, they feel they feel alive. They That's feel right. Alive doing so. Now, remember, and again, if Brian was on this, he could definitely give us the rundown mm. on neuro, neurochemistry. But I can tell you that from our maps of neurotransmitters out here, we first of all find a tremendous amount of dopamine. And as Brian has said on many an occasion, dopamine wants more dopamine. So right there, the addiction cycle is being supported. We also talk about them being adrenaline or uh, junkies. And so this is where the adrenaline is at its highest. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are very, very high. And this small location on the change grid where we have the expressive driver and part of the expressive driven driver this is where endorphins are raging so you put together endorphins adrenaline and dopamine and uh, to dragon's point these people are seeking the thrill because it's the fuel that they live on um, and sooner or later, this is a formula for uh, overestimating ability and or underestimating challenge and finding yourself in a truly life-threatening uh, kind of situation. I forget who the thrill seeker was we were looking at, and they were just giving a rundown of all the surgeries they've had, all the bones they've broken, all the whatever that's happened. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm thinking... If I just had the smallest boo-boo, I would have stopped doing it. <laughs> so I don't need to have multiple surgeries before I rethink my choice of uh, hobbies. So uh, there you go. If I, uh, and yesterday I was listening to an interview on NPR, and it was all about thrill-seeking behaviors of executives. So Boris, this might actually come back to, uh, to your, uh, your experiences with uh, your clients that are, uh, that are struggling. Um, but it was talking about how as you move further and further up the ranks of a corporation, they want you to sign insurance 
uh, papers where you agree that you are not going to do things like ride motorcycles, jump out of airplanes, blah, 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 blah. And so this whole interview was about the number of CEOs who flatly refuse to sign such things. They refuse to say that, that because of their business success, they're going to give up their life. And so they continue to ride their motorcycles. And this particular insurance executive, I forget which company he was with. Oh, no, actually, he had a skiing incident. He liked um, uh, doing kind of more competitive mm. sorts of skiing, heading down a black diamond, uh, looked over his shoulder for something and caught an edge, slammed into a tree, fell down a ravine some 60 feet and ended up face down unconscious in a stream. Um, in the process, he broke his back in multiple places. He was comatose for quite a period of time uh, and ended up needing rather extensive surgeries and rehab to get back on track. You think he gave up uh, skiing? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> he still flatly refuses to do it, even though I guess he was like totally uh, unable to do anything other than lie in the hospital bed or uh, go through rehab for months and months. Uh, so, but they were all talking about how, nope, I'm not going to stop doing that. Well, there's an interesting point there, which is mm -hmm. in large corporate environments, it's oftentimes a standard issue. You know, if you're going to take on this role as a CFO of a company, you're going to not only sign those documents, but we're going to insure you uh, in case of a loss because you're a loss to the company. And That's there's right. key person insurance on all these individuals. But what's interesting is those same individuals in a small and medium-sized company typically don't have that type of insurance for their own family. Yeah. Right? They're, the biggest loss of them doing these types of activities really to their own family besides the company. Yeah. Um, and they don't even think twice about Right, because obviously they're going to compromise their income earning abilities. That's going to immediately damage the family. Well, it was interesting that one of the points one of the CEOs was making, he goes, you know, when you think about the qualities you look for in a, uh, in a top CEO, um, he says, you really don't want the individual who isn't a risk taker. You don't exactly. want the individual who, you know, you want the, the, the individual who likes the high speed cars and who likes the thrill sports and who likes going to places and doing things that have never, I think this all came up because of, of Bezos and uh, who else, who's our guy from Virgin? Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. yeah, Elon Musk and uh, the, the Virgin uh, guy uh, and who, who decided to pay mm -hmm. their own way to space. Brandon. Brandon. Mm -hmm. yeah, Br is Branson. 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 Yeah. Branson. All right. And so you got these three guys that are all kind of in competition with one another, uh, but they're all, is there a greater thrill than going to space? So, you know, so it was all, I think that's what triggered this little interview thing about it. Should those behaviors be allowed among the executives? And they were interviewing some of the people from inside of, um, Amazon, I guess. And uh, they were kind of saying like, we gave up trying to control him long ago. And so all we can really do is insure ourselves to the hilt. Because <laughs> um, he's going to do whatever he wants to do no matter what. And I thought, all right, well, good. Yeah, they wouldn't be in those positions if they didn't have those qualities. They wouldn't be running big companies. Right. They say. have to yeah. be very of welcoming of risk. So go ahead, David Boris. No, you're, you're right. down to, you know, he started this business in a garage. He was not a space traveler. Right. So I think, I think sometimes success breeds uh, more confidence that leads to greater risk taking. Right. So, you're right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Each success prepares the ground for the next greater challenge. But I'm isn't all gambling based on that? I think people invest in the stock market somewhat recklessly at times because of this don't you think so i mean i think it applies to well you could probably apply it to any and all addictions it, then. yeah really yeah because people who are you know love their drugs are probably on a quest for the greater and greater and greater high it's all these and sooner or so later what is the personality mind. initially that that gravitates to that i mean so you win at the slots and you put more in because you're reinforced you invest in a high risk stock yep. and it gives dividends and you start becoming a maverick 
Mm -hmm. And so, but what starts it initially? Well, that's actually a call that we can revisit if you guys, anytime you really want. But long, long, long ago, we talked about addiction on the change grid and where various addictions started and how they end, ending up advancing. And it's all based, uh, ultimately, it's going to get back to what's your personality. So uh, just as a bit of reviewing it, um, if we talk about uh, gambling, for example, mm -hmm. all four danger zones are mm -hmm. prone to a gambling addiction, but because dopamine lives there, right? Wherever there's dopamine, mm -hmm. there's addiction. Mm -hmm. And so, but what's the difference between the gambling that an outgrid person wants to do versus the gambling an upgrid person wants to do, an ingrid or a downgrid? So what form of gambling, uh, what's their mindset around gambling, et cetera, around each one of them? Mm -hmm. so, Calculate, yeah. Calculated risk against absolutely no calculated risk. Well, exactly. But I promise you, an executive who's mm -hmm. in the outgrade danger zone, who's got an issue with gambling or just wants to go gamble for recreational purposes, is not going to sit down at a slot machine. Mm -hmm. No, what are they mm -hmm. going to do? Where do they want to be in the casino? Right, right. Yeah. The you know, they want to be the big, you know, the, the more glamorous things, roulette, craps, baccarat. I mean, they, they want to be, and they'll go to the high rollers room or whatever uh, happens to be there. That's a very different mindset. Okay, tell me where bingo is. There are plenty <laughs> of people addicted to bingo. It is not these outgraded people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just not it. So the, uh, the bingo players are the people that are very far in grid, conservative gamblers, low stakes, uh, you know, uh, things that they can easily understand, maybe have some fun while they're doing it. Um, when I think about upgrade gambling things, these are the people who are uneducated, um, just doing it for the fun of it, for the hell of it. So people who board on, bet on sporting events who have no concept at all of anything that might begin to influence the outcome, they've decided to plunk money down just because of the thrill of the moment. Remember that stress is not always a negative thing. Sometimes stress is being overly excited about something positive that can be going on. And then you get the people that are very far down grid. Again, not very challenging, very high ability. I can share with you that we have a, a friend in our life who has been, if I said profoundly successful at video poker and ask you to attach a price tag to uh, or an earnings tag to what I've just said, I will encourage you to magnify that tenfold and you still won't be close to how much money they've made off of video poker. So um, they, they talk about it. Their level of expertise is extremely high. They do not consider it to be challenging at all. They consider it to be nothing more than choosing the right machine and sitting down because it's got to offer the right odds or they simply won't play the play the game. Not all video poker is uh, is identical. They choose the right machine. If the casino doesn't offer a machine that offers the odds that they're looking for, they won't even play in that casino. But if they can find the, the, that machine that offers those odds, they will sit there for hours upon hours upon hours upon hours because to them it's nothing but math. Nevertheless, they're sitting there for hours upon hours upon hours. Uh, so is there an addiction kind of thing going on? The answer is, yeah. But uh, And by the way, they certainly also have their opportunities to lose. Um, the odds might be slightly in their favor, but that doesn't guarantee anything. Um, but anyway, so that's it. So I, I think that you could find that type of addiction in all four uh, quadrants, but they, uh, how that addiction is experienced, expressed, whatever is going to change. Okay, thoughts about that? So, uh, so thrill seeking in the danger zones, I, you're not going to find all these danger zones r riding motocross bikes on the crests of, of you know, drop and die hills. <laughs> that, that's outgrid. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we also, by the way, we were able to identify the drug of choice, the alcohol of choice, et cetera, as you move to these different areas on the change grid. 
Um, okay, so, um, okay, we talked about Outgrid and my little notes. Let me look at these. Okay, so now I wanted to go back to Boris. So Boris, how often do these clients that your organization targets as ideal prospects, how many of them are dealing with Outgrid uh, fears? and the way they're responding is causing or has caused the real trouble that they've gotten themselves into. Thoughts about that? I think that the best way I would answer that is that there are individuals that are able to moderate mm -hmm. their fears and yep. they, they're the ones that are successful at yep. dealing with the issues. Yep. Um, some of them may have had uh, issues in the past, even with drugs and alcohol historically, but they've overcome those challenges and they're able to control themselves. And so they live right where you're indicating Squiggly, right, now, right, right there, right there. But yeah. uh, the ones that are really the troublesome ones are the ones that go out grid all the way and they tend to lose their ability to, to perceive mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they, they can't, they lose their emotional intelligence around their team and the people that they're interacting with. Um, they have no perception about what their actual abilities are, and they, they tend to think that they're much greater than they are. Um, and they're the ones that I call the bull in the china shop. Yep. They start bowling over people, bowling over uh, all kinds of uh, things in their way in an attempt to, to try to succeed at what they're trying to do. And That's right. That's right. And now add to that that if they have, even if they don't have a profound substance abuse problem, one of the ways that people in the outgrid danger zone self-medicate is to, um, you know, have a drink. Uh, the drug of choice out here is generally cocaine. It's usually some sort of a stimulant is uh, what they tend to be attracted to. And alcohol-wise, they like top shelf, really high quality um, spirits, more so than beer or whatever, you know, anything. Else. They, they like to, they, they want the stuff. Um, so imagine what happens if they go and now they take that drug or they take uh, the, that alcohol. How does that now affect their level of anger, their level of grief, their level of fear? Obviously, it's all just going to be um, amplified. And now it gets even worse, even worse, even worse. What's interesting oftentimes is they don't even recognize the fact that other people do see what is actually going on, mm, right? Yeah. Uh, their, their teammates and other people know something is off and, and what might be going on in the background, but their perception is nobody can tell that I'm doing this activity. Well, of course they can't, of course they can't. Well, and that's it now, this is something I don't think we've talked about on these this series of calls, but one of the things that we talk about is that as someone moves further and further out grid, um, if you can think of it physically, be on, be on the heart line and start walking towards this uh, grid uh, powerless point, you're always facing forward. And as you are facing forward, you are able to see less and less of what's behind you. And so it's not at all surprising that someone who is in the outgrid danger zone becomes totally unaware that there are even other people involved. And we uh, say that one of the remedies, one of the in-grid maneuvers is to work with this individual on turning around and seeing all of these people and all of these other things uh, that are behind them. And then, you know, appreciating those things, tapping into those things, et cetera. Uh, so that's, you're absolutely right. They don't even, they, they think that there's no one even notices them. Uh, so, you know, no one's, no one's any the wiser of what they're doing. No one's watching them. No one knows. And the answer is really turn around. <laughs> so. <laughs> Ta da! You got a whole flock of people who are fully aware of everything that you're doing, <laughs> fully aware. Does that, uh, that resonate, uh, Boris? Yeah, well, I mean, the analogy uh, I use is there's a speed limit for everybody. And just like driving in a car, if you go beyond a certain speed limit, you can't be looking in the rear view mirror. Oh, well, there you are. And there, there's there your you problem. Are. And you need there to be able are. to see the cops behind you if you're exceeding the speed. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah. So again, because they're so risk tolerant, um, they, they minimize whatever the impact of those risks may be or the likelihood those risks uh, may happen to them. If you tell them that there's a, an 80% chance of failure, they're going to focus on the fact that they're part of the 20% that'll succeed. 
-hmm. So those kinds of statistics don't mind. It just make them feel even more emboldened. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they're going to be there. Let's see. Uh, David, Edie, you're both unmuted. Anything you want to throw in? No, just listening. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So uh, now fear. Do we think we find fear downgrid? So think about that. You're in a situation you perceive there as being zero challenge and ability uh, is extremely high. You think maybe, these maybe fear of being found out. Yeah, and even then, I wonder if in that moment, are they still there? They kind of go like, um, yeah, all right. So we'll talk more about that. If there really is a fearful, um, a legitimate fearful element in their mm -hmm. environment and they're this far downgrid about it, then what are they doing? Nothing. Because they're in denial around it. They don't see it. They do nothing, whatever the case may be. So I think that's part of what you're, you're uh, getting at is that they don't even, they don't acknowledge it. They didn't even notice it. It could very well be there. And so this is where we talked about when it came to control, that people, as we move from uh, upgrade, downgrade, up in stress, people feel three words. Out of control. Three, out of control. What are they doing in power stress? Uh, uh uh, seeking control. Seizing control. control. Seizing control. Seizing control. What about in power? They feel two words. In control. In control. Down in power. Apathy. They assume. Assume. Control. Assume. Because they, they just were. They were definitely in control. No, 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 uh, no debate mm -hmm. about it. And so they, they mellowed out and were like, yeah, I assume that's all still taken care of. And ultimately they end up in apathy where they could be feeling, and what's our little phrase there? Illusion. An illusion. illusion of control. And so think about that. This individual, this far down grid may very well find themselves in a situation that should legitimately threaten them, should uh, d literally deserves mm -hmm. a stress response. And instead, they're just dum da dum da dum da dum. Nope, that's not happening. So, are they in total denial? Are they just, you know, what's going on? There, it's all so under I the think radar. Denial. I think you hit it on the. I think you hit it on the head. There's a lot of denial. Now, I wonder if it's active denial, passive denial. Active denial means they acknowledge that the threat exists, but they're denying it. Where passive denial just is more mm. like being clueless around us. So things like, well, nothing's going on. Yeah, I think way, way down grid, it's, it's clueless. It's, yeah, it's very clueless. Yeah, they're very much on autopilot. Yeah. Yeah, this individual, you know. Yeah, so, so I would say to you that while fearful situations may exist for people that are down grid, people that are this far down grid do not experience fear. Fine enough, yeah, legitimate. They yeah. don't experience fear. Okay, so I know we got fear up grid. I know we got fear out grid. There's no fear down grid, even though there could be legitimate reasons for it. There, there's just not. <laughs> and then we look in grid. In grid's very interesting. Do we encounter fear in grid? Yeah, I, maybe that's a little bit more of fear being found out. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Well, you don't perceive much challenge and certainly not a lot of ability. So you're questioning your performance or your actions. And uh, that question could turn into a fear. Yeah. And remember the way that people in the Ingrid Danger Zone deal with threats in their environment is to fade. So they want to kind of disappear into the woodwork. So I think that's all the about uh, about not being found out. No, oh, X is happening. Let me just step out of the way. Let me just step into the shadow. Let me just, you know, move out of the awareness. What's going on? So, so I think that they may very well feel that fear, even anticipated. They might even have fear. Um, I want to say sensors that are active long before any of the rest of us. Uh, have those fear sensors be activated. So, because again, keep in mind, if we looked at these engagement rings, um, the people that are this far in grid um, are very, very often in the unaware area. This is all, so this is all about upgrade and downgrade awareness. This is pre-aware. So they're not necessarily consciously aware of anything that's 
might be threatening them. So. I, I would argue that that once you're past that danger zone in grid, you know, moving further in, that it's all about existence survival. So yeah. fear, fear is about can I continue to exist in the world? You know, right, right, right. do I have a place in the world? It's yeah. that kind of fear. And then when you move into PowerPoint, there's no fear. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, but yeah. but 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 in but in between, it's more about my survival, my place in the world, do I have a place? And that's- Yeah, well, we, we've often said that people in the Ingrid danger zone exist, but do not live. So because mm -hmm. to whatever degree they can, they're trying to be as non-participative as possible. Mm -hmm. So they don't have much ability, so they don't want to do our perceived ability, so they don't want to do much challenging. All that being said, let me bring to your guys' attention that the interesting thing about this in-grid uh, danger zone, this in-grid quadrant, this amiable, amiable quadrant is that all five levels of tension are present and they are all present in the normal proportions. We would find them anywhere else on the, on the change grid. So they're experiencing the whole range of everything, but their world is just so much smaller than what the full change grid would represent. So, um, so yeah, so they can have a stress response, but it's not gonna be as expressed as the stress response is found further up grid. That's why I kind of view these people in the Ingrid danger zone if I wanted to get all psychological about them. I think this is where you find a lot of low level neurotics, a lot of those just nervous types so because there's not exactly anything that's profoundly mm. threatening them, but nevertheless, there's always this uneasiness mm. that's happening mm. out there. And maybe that gets back to David's point about they're afraid of being exposed or found out. And again, uh, we've talked about this before. We do not find these people in business settings all that often. We don't find these people in our classrooms. We don't find these people reaching out for the kind of work that we do. Well, because that would require them to participate um, in yeah, their that's life. That's very interesting because for me, I, I'm trying to, in each one of these areas, try to have like an avatar in my head of what this person looks like, feels like. Yeah. And um, I have a hard time with that area because I don't really know too many people that kind of fit into there, but I would think that one of the descriptors would be they're highly insecure. Highly insecure, absolutely highly insecure. In the worst case scenario, I would say your avatar for this is the abused individual. So these are individuals who have been battered, whether literally or self-inflicted or just it's an emotional kind of a thing. For whatever reason, they, they have been minimized or feel minimized. Uh, something, a long, long, long history of, uh, of you know, life history has basically conditioned them to hold the belief that they are a very um, incapable person who can't begin to handle even the minimal challenges that life operates. Mm -hmm. And so they become mousy, they become uh, very withdrawn. So you kind of see these people, uh, in movies you see that they're kind of disappeared in the background and you just kind of know what's their issue. You know? the, um, I would also put maybe some special needs individuals uh, uh, back there. Yeah, um, and in fact, uh, I would say there's some, definitely some special mm. needs behavior sets that we'll find inside of this kind of a, of a thing. And maybe the truth is, and again, I'm not a psychologist, it may be that anyone who, mm. um, who routinely plots this far in grid, and I'm just talking about the occasional activity, I'm talking about you know, this is the essence of their life. I would wonder if they are a special needs person, but whatever their issue is, isn't something that's readily visible um, or something like that. There's a lot of purely emotional, um, you know, debilitating sorts of things that arise. You know, the outgrade people are the perpetrators. They need someone to victimize. If this person is their, is their targeted victim, over a long period of time, how much of their self can be eroded before there's no sense of self remaining? Would you also describe them as depressed and anxious? 
Well, because, yes, because they have all five levels of tension available to them, depression, which we would normally think is being a downgrid mm -hmm. kind of a thing, they have their own, uh, their own version of downgrid. Mm -hmm. It's just a tiny world mm -hmm. compared to the big world. So yeah, they have got all the, they've got the depression, they've got the anxiety. If anything, they've got anything but the pride. That mm -hmm. is what ultimately they have to find in order to take control of their own life and get themselves out of this situation. You know, this is interesting. I was at my son's house last night and his wife got, she's temporarily in this uh, charge nurse position. She is not like leadership. And I remember she kept saying, no, no, I'm number two. And we'll talk about fading. Everything in the conversation was, no, I don't want any responsibility. I want to be in the limelight. I'm number two. Mm -hmm. And everything she said was just let me fade out. Yep. And and but I'm thinking people in grid, she's very attractive. And I'm wondering if even borderline personality disorders fall into this, that people in grid will find one thing they can hang on to. It might be their vanity, their looks, they have their nails done off, all of right, that. Right. That there is one thing that makes them someone in the world where they can be discovered. But that's it. Right. And they sense. hang on to that. And that becomes yes. the, the sin. I think that that's part of I forget who we were talking yeah. to about this, but yeah. they were talking about uh, social media as an addiction. Yeah, and that's people who want to be the the social media influencer, the personality or what our YouTube star or whatever it is. And yeah. sometimes we look at the now it's TikTok is all the thing. But sometimes don't you look at these people and kind of go like, if it wasn't for your looks, there's really nothing else. There. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you take their looks away. And that's why um, the uh, I remember the discussion we were having was about the, the incidence of suicide in people who want to be social media um, influencers, etc. Uh -huh. And greatly overestimate their ability and underestimate the challenge, or even the workload uh, yeah. necessary to, uh, to achieve that level of following. Let me share another experience that I think fits this. Um, uh, I was speaking at a wellness conference and they, who was the bionic woman? Lindsay, what was her Wagner. name? Wagner. Who? Wagner. Lindsay yes. Wagner. Yep. Yes. And what I was aware of, when they are not in a role outside their own bodies, they, she was, her knees were trembling. She was a mess on stage. So it's interesting that these people, when they get into their alter ego or something and can play a role, they have this freedom to express themselves that when they're in their own body, they mm -hmm. are prisoners. They really are. They're trapped. Then when I went to the Maui Writers Conference, I saw the same thing happen with Debbie Fisher's daughter, whatever her name is. She died about the same time as her mother. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. she, she was a total mess. The same thing that when they are who they are and in themselves it's it's pathetic but 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 you know i think that's part of their motivation to go into acting because they have a, a newfound freedom that they don't have in their own bodies that's i i've just observed that with yeah carrie fisher's daughter is billy lord is that who You're no thinking? carrie Fi no you know what i bet it was it was Debbie Fisher's daughter. It was Carrie Fisher. Debbie yeah, Fisher's I, was, yeah, okay, it was. Um, yeah, it was, it was Debbie Fisher's daughter, Carrie Fisher, that I saw. Carrie, Debbie Reynolds. It, it was pathetic. Debbie was Reynolds. So, it was Debbie Reynolds, yes. Debbie and, and Reynolds' daughter. Carrie Fisher is, is yes. Carrie Fisher, yes. yes. Okay. But she was sitting there pulling her hair, every, every expression of anxiety. She was just a mess. Yeah. And I've noticed this with people that, yeah, and so yeah, having a character ends up being a stabilizing uh, yes. opportunity for them because they can yeah. focus all that energy into whatever it is they happen to be uh, be really working on. Yeah. And, and introverts, when you give them a stage, it's amazing how they'll just, you know, but, the, but they don't have to interact with people. They, you know, they can perform. Yeah. But and again, you know, now we're, we're, we're going back to looking at a continuum and we might yeah. be looking at some things that have never been looked at before. Like, for example, um, mm -hmm. we talk about um, people being on the um, uh, on the spectrum, 
So the autism mm -hmm. spectrum, that spectrum may be a, a much wider than anyone <laughs> thinks it is. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that some of the most famous actors we've ever, we've ever experienced mm -hmm. are people who in and of their own daily life are very uh, troubled. They've got all kinds mm -hmm. of issues, et cetera, et cetera, might even be autistic or uh, whatever the variations on autism may mm -hmm. include. Um, but you give them a role and suddenly they're mm -hmm. in that scene where everything ends up being absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, again, we're not psychologists. Well, some of you are psychologists, but I'm not a psychologist. So, uh, you know, we'd have to figure out how do you go about determining such a thing, but it's got to exist. There's got to be, look, there's got to be a lot of famous people who bottom line are crazy people. Um, but see, but see, when I did psychodrama, it was the same thing. If you had somebody that had all this repressed anger for years and years, I mean, passive aggressive, the whole bit, I'm thinking of someone in particular 40 years ago. When I put her into another role, there's this newfound freedom to express anger and to feel the catharsis of it. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but so, yeah, it is, it's very, it, it is, it does work. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Um, okay. So again, so as far as fear goes, I think we'll find fear upgrid, outgrid. We'll find a great denial of fear. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, that sneeze has been building for a while. Okay. Um, we'll find uh, some uh, denial of fear down there or some cluelessness about fear downgrid. So they, they don't experience fear in the moment. Um, mm. And in grid, it's a different kind of a fear. It's there, mm. but it's perhaps quiet, um, mm. more pervasive. Um, yeah, mm. so yeah, okay. Because I look like, you know, when you're up grid and something frightens you, that feels like it's um, an incident. <laughs> And once the incident passes, the fear goes away. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, you know, one way or another, you deal with it, it's done. The person who is outgrid feels the fear and fights against it. So they're actively, uh, Kathy's word was aggressing against mm -hmm. that fear. So these people are doing something with it. Again, downgrid's kind of clueless. I think about the person who's this far in grid that fear becomes almost endemic. Mm -hmm. Is that the word? It's just part of the fiber of, of their being. Every moment of every day, there is this low-grade fear and a low-grade anger and low-grade guilt. All those things are still neighbors mm -hmm. here uh, for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Isn't it nice that we can figure out exactly how the world operates? Mm -hmm. by having a <laughs> Uh, who are we kidding? Uh, okay, so um, that's pretty much, uh, I think, what we can talk about for fear. Oh, well, well, one last thing. Where, what happens in the center of the change grid? What is the opposite of fear? Pride. Uh, pride, I'd say, is part of it. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Of it. What's, what's, if I'm not afraid of something, is it that I'm at peace with something? So I, I'm trying I thought to think love, like, wasn't love the opposite of fear? I thought love was the opposite of fear. Well, we could put that one on here too. I'm just trying to think like <laughs> the center of the change grid on the one hand is the place of full awareness of all of life and life's possibilities. But because you're detached from what's going on, you're feeling really nothing. I mean, you're, you're detached emotionally, you're detached intellectually, you're detached physically. So you're in this observational kind of place. So, is that courageous? Well, yeah. courageous feels like I've stepped out grid a bit mm -hmm. because I think is we got confused when we were talking about what's the difference between cur confidence, courage, and bravery. And one of them was, was bravery, courageousness put to the test? I think that's how he said, like, you can be courageous until I put you in battle and then we'll see how brave you really are. Or you can, you know, so, or you can be as brave as you want, and then we'll put you in battle and see how courageous you are. So I forget one of those is as a step beyond the other in terms of risk exposure, what you're doing. But nevertheless, they're, they're both definitely leaning, if not considerably further out grid. So in grid, I'm just in this place of, of what is the absence of fear? I mean, um, peace. Peace. Calmness, calmness. If it's peace, calmness, then that would mean that as we step off of that spot in any direction, we're going to approach a place where fear might be waiting for us, or even an inability to detect fear. 
which is what apathy might be. I don't but, think there's you know, just one word. Go, go I, think, I just looked it up, and it's the opposite of fear is clarity. Is it clarity? Hmm. Clarity, curiosity, or trust, or courage, or calmness. Really, calmness I can see. Yeah. And then it says, is love the opposite of fear, which is what I always thought it was. The rejection of a set of features that we do not accept in ourselves causes many problems. When we do not accept ourselves out of fear, we do not love ourselves. Fear is the opposite of love. Yeah, I, I, and I've read that a lot, too. I'm thinking yeah. what, when I'm thinking about fear in its full um, range of expression, um, I don't think that love is going, if my house is on fire, that fear that I'm feeling, it does not have the opposite of as being love. Okay, well, you might like this better, T. The next one is the opposite of fear is peace. The other point of the line is peace, the state of peace. That does work the, in that particular like that situation. Better? So mm -hmm. I can certainly see that sometimes the opposite of love is fear. Um, but mm -hmm. oftentimes there are a lot more opposites of fear than love. So I think we'd have to look at sets and subsets to do that. Anywho, it's quite quite interesting. I I also think there are many words that could be the opposite of fear. Yeah. It just, yeah. It just shows how how loaded that word is. Fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we use fear to describe a very broad range of circumstances. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, next time around, uh, lust is the next one on the list. So that should be interesting. Maybe I'll send out an announcement about that and see how many people decide to join our call purely because I use the word. We'll be looking at lust. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just... Yes, yeah. go ahead, Question. Dragon. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah I, I just want to come back to, to something you talked about uh, because I, I haven't experienced that here in my surroundings, that the companies insist or uh, try to uh, get people to to stop some things in their lives because it's dangerous or whatever. And we were yeah. talking about the person itself. But what is your experience or general point of view? Has the company a right to do that? Is that generally accepted? It's okay. I would say to you that the, the stockholders have the right to insure themselves, insure their investment. And so if I happen to be heavily invested in a company that is very much dependent on the CEO, like right now, Elon Musk, uh, maybe Tesla could continue without him being there, but he seems to be like still centrally involved, just like Steve Jobs might have been earlier on in the world of Apple and all that kind of thing. As long as there is this equation that says the vitality of that leader equals the value of the company, then mm. I have the right as an investor to say, you either stop doing risky kinds of things or we're going to make sure that our investment is, um, is uh, uh, insured to the absolute hilt. I believe we have the right to do that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you know, T, can we, can, can, why are we not, when we work with the change grid, knowing that as people assume different roles, it does rewire them, it does change their pay behavior. So if we want to move somebody from out grid to a little more of the center in grid, whatever, why are we not using a little bit um, whether it doesn't have to be an acting out role play, but an imagination act as if whatever, wouldn't that be a good way to move people on the change well, grid? Well, absolutely. And that's why okay. when, we're, when we're looking at these maneuvers mm -hmm. and you actually do any kind of training or any mm -hmm. work using the different maneuver sets, a mm -hmm. lot of them allow you to create scenarios where you could say, you know, imagine this, behave like this, take on the role of that. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if they're very far downward and we say that this individual needs to awaken their feelings of pride uh, mm -hmm. in a more engaged kind of thing, we could certainly create a whole lot of very interactive mm -hmm. scenarios around that and have role plays and, mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things. But what I think is really um, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is say, hey, entire world of human development how do you go about helping people to change? And as people start to identify the methodologies they use, can we see that those methodologies resonate with one of the maneuvers? Or maybe just maybe someday someone is going to uh, introduce a maneuver, or a methodology that, uh, that identifies a whole new maneuver. 
because right now we've got four maneuvers for each of the four kinds of things. Four was not a magic number. I promise you, we're, we've exhausted ourselves trying to come up with number five. <laughs> so, so I believe there are more, but they just haven't been identified yet. You know, this would be good for police departments that are learning de-escalation. I'm serious. I well, mean, sure. Be- well, because this I is should. the whole point. It's like, yeah. and you know, I would say this if we want to do this as a, as a topic someday. Mm. One of the biggest problems with policing is that the police officer has their own set of emotions and reactions. And mm. so if something happens and the police officer is personally moved up into stress, and mm-hmm. now we put on them the burden of managing somebody else's stress. That's not a very workable situation. I can only mm-hmm. manage other people's tension if I and do it well if I'm down in power. But if I'm up in stress, I'm just as much a victim of all the things that happen when someone's up in stress as the next guy is. Mm-hmm. And so now if we've got both the police and the the um, um, the suspect and everybody's up in stress and you got all these witnesses and they're all up in stress, this is not a good formula. So I would say when it comes to de-escalation, mm-hmm. the first thing we need to really will focus on is helping police officers to manage their own responses. That's a good point. Whatever's going on, because if they can manage their own responses, Mm -hmm. I promise you, I don't need to teach a police officer who is in power how to Mm de-escalate people who already know that. And they're Mm -hmm. able to do it. Where the people who are very far upgrade, I can teach them everything about de-escalation you want. But if I can't get them to de-escalate their own levels Mm -hmm. of tension first, they're not going to be able to do what they've been taught. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great point. And I don't think it's included in a lot of the training. I don't. No, it's not. It's always, going, you know, we have to say, oh, uh, you know, we need to work on the individual because this we know for certain. 99.9% mm-hmm. of all the police officers out there are perfectly lovely, responsible uh, individuals mm-hmm. who are doing mm-hmm. something of great service to our, to our community. It's this mm-hmm. tiny little percentage mm-hmm. And it is not surprising when you go, like, if I added up all the people in law enforcement all across the country, I don't know, but am I looking at millions of people are involved in law enforcement coast to coast? Mm-hmm. I don't know how big the industry is, but it's mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands if it's not over a million. So mm-hmm. we're looking at a tiny handful of bad, of bad performers. And uh, we're ending up, you're looking at, that doesn't say that, you know, overall things don't need to be reformed. Right. Maybe they do. But it starts by going like, how do we do a better job of identifying those individuals who have this issue? You know, we don't need police officers with anger management problems. We just don't. So, Mm -hmm. so how do we go about helping an officer recognize that they have anger management issues and then help them deal with those anger management issues before um, Mm. we put them in a situation where those issues can end up leading to the kinds of problems that are going to get international attention. Yeah, you would think I that's a part of their regular uh, education. Mm-hmm. And it may be part of the regular education. And this is where I can get into talking about mm-hmm. the problem with the police union is a very mm-hmm. big issue because their job, they're doing what the union does. The union does its job is to protect its members. Mm-hmm. Well, that means sometimes they've got to give somebody not only every benefit of the doubt, but do that to such a degree that um they may very well not be doing the best job they can of helping their members get the kinds of of support and guidance that they really need. So that's part of it. I mean, yeah, go ahead, uh, David, you were going to say something. I I was just going to say, I hate to beat my own drum, but I think it's a hiring issue. Yes. You know, you, you can, you can, you can screen out for those personality traits. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep, yep, yep. it's also a training issue because uh, Dragon, I don't know what the standards are in, in the Netherlands, <laughs> but in the US, each local municipality gets to define to a certain degree what police training actually re- requires or involves. And some of them inside of less time than it takes to become a barber, you can become a police officer. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, no, I mean, you cannot become so quickly a police officer. Here. Right, so this is part of it. We need to know what is standard police training and is this something that we're allowed to apply nationwide? You understand the United States, it's called the United States because the states are really what's most important and the federal mm -hmm. government is supposed to do really minimal things to assist the states. Um, and so, so each state has its own rules. And even inside of each state, each county could have its own sort of rules. And so there is no such thing as standardized police training in the United States. There might be some general guidelines that are used, but there's no such thing as a standardized, um, you know, program that you got to go and graduate from and prove whatever but we have it for people to do massages massage therapists have to go through 1200 hours of training before they can lay hands on a client 1200 hours so and t there is no certification for hypnosis a ditch yeah. digger can put up a shingle and do hypnosis and say they're a, a hypnotherapist well, un mm -hmm. until the early 1900s um, mm -hmm. medicine was not a licensed field anyone could could, could call themselves a doctor until anybody. when was that, T? When was that? I think it was 1908. 1908. Really? Yeah. Really? Anybody could be a doctor. You could be self-trained. You could do all that kind of stuff. It was not formalized as a licensed field. Yeah. Wow. So anyway. All righty. Uh, well, that's good. For yeah, there good. you go. Okay. So uh, we'll pick up with lust on uh, Tuesday and I will uh, mm -hmm. uh, send out an announcement about that. See if we can get some of our flock back. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye everyone. Cool. Bye, bye. Care, bye. bye. Hmm. Yep, she does it at the end of every call. <laughs> <laughs> she just yes. did it. It's yes. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> bye everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>